today I'm going to talk about um, seeking a computer-free proof of the four-color theorem. So um, the, the goal of, this, of, of these talks was to talk about stuff that's going to happen in the future, and this is um, not a problem in which I'm an, I'm an expert, but I want to talk about some other people's work. So um, first I want to describe the problem. So as you can see here um, is a, a map of England, and there's these different counties. And um, in the 1800, well, 1852, uh, Francis Guthrie um, noticed that while he was coloring the, this map of England with um, these counties, he could use just four colors. So um, if, you, if you look at this uh, map here, you can see that there's uh, just four colors used. Of course, uh, Wales and Scotland, I guess, are not included. But, um, and um, the properties of, the, uh, of this map is that the, each county is uh, one continuous region. And um, so they're not disconnected. Um, and each uh, county shares a, a certain borderline between it, which is sort of approximated uh, mathematically by uh, an arc or a line. Um, and of course, counties then that are far away from each other, even though they're colored the same color, they um, are distinct, in, um, whereas ones that are neighboring have to be colored with, with different colors. So uh, that's, what, that's what I mean by uh, coloring a map. So it should be coloring with um, colors so that adjacent countries or counties or whatever you're coloring have, a, have different colors, but ones that are far away can have the same color. And so um, Francis Guthrie was not a mathematician. Um, he was a, a lawyer, I believe. But um, So he published this problem in... Um, the Athenaeum uh, in 1954, uh, sorry, 1854, and um, he had a little uh, blurb on tinting maps, which I've blown up here. So um, he says that in, in tinting maps, so tinting, I mean, it means coloring. Um, he wants to use as few colors as possible um, so that um, it satisfies the properties I was just saying. And he's found by experience that four colors are necessary and sufficient for this purpose. And he couldn't prove this, but he wanted to know uh, whether this is true. So he advertised this to the world in, um, in this little short little note here. And um, he also uh, com communicated it to, um, uh, <clears throat> to some mathematicians who then um, were, were interested in this problem. And um, in 1879, then, um, Alfred Kempe published proof of the four-color theorem in the American Journal of Mathematics. He wasn't a, um, a <clears throat> professional mathematician. And then an, uh, just a year later, um, Peter Guthrie Tate published uh, another proof, somewhat different, um, in, in the Proceedings of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. Um, then in um, 1890, uh, Percy John Haywood published an article that refuted Kempe's proof, so um, about Ten years later, it was found that it was actually wrong, and um, you know the math literature is is not completely reliable, although I would say it's m much more reliable may maybe than many other sciences. Uh, that's not a I'm not trying it's it's not a dig. I'm just saying that um, we're <clears throat> it's the nature of mathematics I think. And then in 1891, um, Julius Peterson also refuted Tate's proof. So um, so after these failed proofs, then the four color problem became sort of notorious and attracted the attention of a lot of uh, mathematicians. Um, David Birkhoff, one of the, the first well-known American mathematicians, Hassler Whitney, and William Tutt. And um, in some sense, attempts to, to solve this problem led to the development of uh, fields of, of mathematics, um, like graph theory and um, topology and combinatorics. Um, so I wanted to say a little bit more about this, uh, this problem. So um, a proof was uh, made in, in 1977 by um, Apple and Hawkins. So that's um, uh, <clears throat> two mathematicians at the Un University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Uh, Wolfgang Hawken is actually the same name, the same mathematician as you heard in the introduction, this uh, virtual Hawken problem that I worked on before. He was a, a topologist studying um, 
three-dimensional spaces and then uh, turned his attention to this um, coloring problem in the 70s. And the, the proof, though, was very unconventional for mathematics up to then. It made use of extensive uh, computer checking. So there was thousands of cases to check, and um, th this, was, this was done by, or, uh, by computer, and there was uh, 100 pages of, um, 400 pages of microfiche supplements that were checked in the summer of 1977 by uh, Wolfgang Hawken and, and his, his daughter, Dorothy Bolstein, who was then an undergraduate. So um, the, the reliability of the proof is relying on all this extensive checking of case-by-case -case analysis. I, d I don't want to go into the, um, the mechanics of the proof. Roughly, it's that you um, had a, a map with um, a bunch of different countries, and you showed that there's certain configurations that were unavoid unavoidable, and in which if you could um, find a coloring of, of, of that map, if you could find a coloring of a certain smaller map, and there was a whole bunch of cases to consider. Um, and um, I guess I, I've heard that Hawken compared the, the proof to sort of an engineering thing where there's possibly lots of different proofs, and you just had to find enough configurations. There was a lot of different ways, but to combine them in some way that made a proof, and um, there it was, it could be many different proofs of this flavor, and indeed, um, some errors were found in the original proof, and then the revision was made, and the proof published um, in 1989 as a monograph. Um, here you see um, a, uh, a letter um, saying four colors suffice, so that was um, celebrating the, the, the proof of that, of, that, of that theorem in the 70s. Um, <clears throat> so and here's also uh, um, the, the beginning of, of a book that discusses the problem. So if you'd like to learn more about this problem, I, you can recommend reading this book about the four color theorem. And there's um, <clears throat> Apple and Hawken. So then um, another proof was given in um, the 1990s, 1997. And, um, the proof also in, in involved extensive computation. In fact, the, the stuff that was done by hand before um, in this proof had to be done with a computer. Um, so the checking these 400 cases or whatever, there was a lot more cases. Um, and, um, it, but in fact, they, you could take their software they had, they had done to, get, to give this proof and you could download it on your own computer and check it for yourself. So, um, you know, most people, most scientists would be completely happy with that, um, you know, more reliable than, uh, than uh, many scientific observations. Um, I don't know how many sigma that would be considered, but it's, it's, anyways, it's a, um, a very reliable uh, fact by this point. And then even more um, reliable in some sense in 2005, um, Benjamin Werner and Georges Gontier formalized a proof of the theorem inside the Koch proof assistant. So, Nowadays, we have a lot of software for checking, um, well, it was initially for checking the um, software itself to see whether it behaved properly, and mathematicians have adapted that to checking proofs to make sure that the proof is logically complete and that every step follows logically from the previous one. And so they went through the, uh, the entire proof of the four-color theorem, and, um, and you can run it on your own system as well and check it so it's as reliable as the Coke proof assistant, um, which has been used to check many, many theorems or algorithms um, across the sciences. So, um, you know, by any um, intents and purposes, this is a, as, as good of a reliable theorem as we might have in mathematics. So, um, I wanted to say a little bit more, though, about the, how do you make a, a precise mathematical formulation of the, of the four-color problem. So um, to make it precise, um, well, as I indicated before, you, could, you should assume the countries or counties are connected. Um, so connectivity is actually a little subtle concept you know, in, embodied in the field of topology. We've heard about topology in, the other, in some math and physics talks today, but um, topology is, is the discussion of connectivity or um, looking at geometric spaces, but you allow them to deform, but without cutting or gluing. Um, and this, this robustness of deformation, so if I have a, of a map, I can deform it a little bit, and uh, as long as I don't um, change the connectivity of the countries or, or counties or whatever, and um, I can you know, make the line straight or something, you're still gonna require the same number of colors. So the number of colorings of a map, for example, is a topological invariant of that map. It's invariant under deformation. You might have to use a little more paint in one than another, but just the number of colors is invariant. 
So, um, but also to make this precise, I said that you had to um, have the, the boundaries between the countries be, um, be curves. And um, this is a mathematical model for what a, what a map looks like. Um, and also to make that precise, you need the Jordan curve theorem, which says that a, a non-self-intersecting curve in the plane, a closed circle, um, actually bounds a, a, a connected region, a, which is topologically a disk. So there's a, um, some serious mathematics that goes into that. This is something that was that Georges Gontier and his collaborators did um, to, to formalize the proof. And anyways, the mathematicians then knew for a long time how to make this problem into a, a well-defined mathematical problem. So it required a little bit of topology, some classic topology from the um, 19th century. Then Tate, this, uh, <clears throat> William Guthrie Tate, um, gave a useful reformulation of the four-color problem. So, um, well, <clears throat> one observation is you can look at uh, maps where um, the, the borders between countries, you have most three countries meeting at a given, um, at a given uh, border. So if this were a map here, then um, you, at each vertex, which is the interface between three or more countries, there's the most three countries there. So if you had four, like uh, the four corners in the United States, um, you can perturb that and you can let um, two of the, the diagonal countries be adjacent. And if you can color that map, then you can color the one in which um, there's the four corners there because there's um, you know, fewer, fewer constraints. There's um, <clears throat> fewer borders between the countries. And so it's even easier to color with four colors. So a, a well-known uh, simplification of the problem is to assume you have a graph in which um, the, all the vertices are degree three, like in this picture here, which is the dodecahedral graph. And um, <clears throat> we can also talk about then abstract graphs. And as I indicated, you know, the, the, the theory of graph theory, which is you know, very important in, in modern mathematics and other applications, is um, thinking about graphs, which to a mathematician are a collection of vertices. So we have a collection of points. And then we have edges connecting them. And here I've drawn edges that overlap. Um, but those should be thought of as distinct, sort of abstract connections between um, vertices. So then we can ask whether a graph can be drawn in the plane so that every pair of edges is non-crossing. Um, and this dodecahedral graph visually is apparently uh, planar. This graph here called the Peterson graph, uh, which is you take this graph and you identify antipodal points um, in some sense, is, is non-planar. Um, and that can be proved, again, using topology. There's the, the Kuratowski um, criterion that, sh that shows that this is um, is not planar. If you contract these five edges around here, you get uh, a complete graph on five vertices, which is, cannot be embedded in a plane. If you try to make uh, a map in which five different kingdoms are simultaneously connected to each other by borders, it's impossible on the surface of the Earth unless they're disconnected. Or, um, <clears throat> so um, anyway, so that's the um, <clears throat> a more precise description of this four color problem. So uh, as I was just indicating, a graph's planar if it can be drawn in the plane. Um, we see some planar graphs here. This is a, this is a non-planar graph, K33 graph. And, um, and looking at some of these graphs, it might not be so obvious whether they can be embedded in the plane or not. This is what's called a Mobius ladder and is also non-planar. So um, if we have a, a trivalent graph, so a graph in which all the vertices have degree three, then um, we'll let Tate of G, so G, I'm calling G a trivalent graph, so I'm going to think of that as some collection of vertices and edges, just finite. And um, we'll let Tate of G denote the number of Tate colorings. So um, what is that? It's a coloring of the edges by three colors so that each vertex meets all, these, all three colors. So here's some examples of Tate coloring. So we have the complete graph on four vertices, every vertex is connected by an edge to every, every other vertex in this graph. And we can color the edges red, blue, and green so that um, at each vertex we see all three colors. That's called a Tate coloring. Here's a Tate coloring of the dodecahedral graph, which has um, <clears throat> 60 different colorings. In fact, they're, they're all invariant, it turns out, by um, automorphism, symmetries, and um, by, by switching the three colors. Here's the 
the Peterson graph again, now draw in, drawn in three dimensions, this has no take colorings. And that can be um, just checked by hand. It's just a, there's finitely many ways you can color the edges and you can run through those permutations or you can try to be a little clever and, and check that it ha doesn't have a three color. <clears throat> so Tate showed that um, take colorings are equivalent to, uh, planar graph is equivalent to four coloring the region. So you start with one region called gray and each time you cross an edge, if there's a take coloring, you change it in according to this pattern here. So um, if, or if two regions are, are col four colored, then um, the edge between them will be cover colored in this way. So if you're green and, and red adjacent, then you'll, the edge will be colored blue. Uh, and so you get a, a, an equivalence between these colorings. This actually requires, a, again, a little bit of topology that uh, this, the, the plane is simply connected that makes this work. But um, all right, so <clears throat> in 2015, Peter Cronheimer, um, a professor at Harvard, and T Thomas Mravka, they um, had two preprints they posted on the archive that um, described a program to try to reprove the four color theorem. They described an invariant now of um, called J sharp of G, which I'm not going to be able to describe, which is now G is a spatial trivalent graph. So um, like this um, Peterson graph here, you're looking at a graph embedded into space. So again, it's a topological object, and it's invariant that's invariant under de up to deformation. So um, this invariant is a vector space of, over the field with two elements, 0 and 1, like uh, Vincent described. But it's just characterized by a number. So it's a number J sharp. Uh, the dimension is the um, number n, which <coughs> characterizes it. Um, and so the definition made use of what's called instanton fluoromology, uh, some ideas of Simon Donaldson, the 2015 Breakthrough Prize winner in mathematics, and um, his work made use of Yang's Mills theory, so a theory in mathematical physics. So um, I've taken a few slides from their talk at the ICM. If you want to learn more about this, I would suggest looking at their, um, their talks from the, the, the International Congress of Mathematicians. So these, they're trivalent graphs. Here's a graph with a bridge. And um, these graphs here are, um, are bridgeless. So um, now I can state their theorem. They show that if you have a, a bridgeless graph, then the, this number, this dimension of the space is positive. And then they conjecture that if you have a planar graph, so that, um, I forgot to say here that they're calling, uh, I call it a web, so a, a web is a, is a spatial graph, then they, they conjecture that the number of take colorings is the same as the dimension of this invariant that they show is non-zero. And then um, in 2017, they show that dimension is greater than or equal to the number of take colorings, so it's um, at least giving some evidence for this conjecture. But it's in the wrong direction if you want to prove the four-color theorem. You'd like to prove the opposite inequality. Um, and so, uh, yeah, maybe I'll just um, skip this, um, these slides here. Let's see. So I'll, I'll say briefly about uh, what they were trying to do. So they thought of colorings instead as um, assigning three axes, coordinate axes, which are perpendicular to each other in R3. Um, and you can think of a take coloring that way. It's just a, a trivial um, observation. But they more generally assigned um, a lines, configurations of lines in, in um, in R3 in which we're perpendicular to each other at, uh, at, each, ver at each vertex. And they counted these in a certain sense, uh, making use of this technology that came from gauge theory and um, knot theory. So um, they showed the non-triviality of this. I think, I guess I'm out of time, so, or, oh, oh I got to, oh, okay, a couple minutes, okay. Um, so they, the, the, the way they showed this was a little surprising, so they, um, they instead counted, instead of counting lines, they, they change it to an invariant counting oriented lines, so lines with a direction on them, and, um, and, and counting in a very careful way uh, using this um, technology from gauge theory. And then um, they showed that if this invariant that they call I sharp of G is non-trivial, then, um, then J sharp of G would be, would be positive, uh, have positive dimension. And then, um, they had previously shown that this I sharp of G is positive when G is a knot or link, so a collection of closed loops um, in, in space. Um, and then they show that that proof extended to the graph case under this bridgeless condition. So um, 
that was, um, so it was a very surprising relation then of this problem, uh, the, or the, potentially the four color problem to some technology they had developed to understand knot theory. So closed loops embedded in three dimensions. So um, a very deep uh, um, involved um, arguments that they had. So um, <clears throat> their conjecture that these two quantities for a planar graph are equivalent would imply that any bridgeless planar graph has a Tate coloring. I forgot, forgot to say that it's also known that if you have a planar graph with a bridge, then the number of Tate colorings is just zero. And then that would imply that it, the regions of the planar graph can be four colored. So um, that would give an, another proof of this, um, of this four color problem if this conjecture holds true. So th th this is a motivating project. I'm sure they're hard at work on it. Um, and I think other people are, are thinking about this. I've been running a seminar on it, trying to understand what they've done. So um, the, the main difficulty then um, is that they don't really have a, a method of computing their invariant, J sharp of G. Um, and if they could develop the techniques to, to compute that invariant, it would probably allow them to prove the theorem or at least maybe find a counterexample um, and, or their, their conjecture, I should say. And, if they, but if they could compute this, it would actually um, be a breakthrough in, um, in, in three and four, four dimensional topology, which is, which is what they study. So it's, um, it would allow you to c compute other interesting invariants and ho hopefully prove uh, other theorems. And I think they came across this sort of accidentally in trying to investigate invariants for knots and some of the properties that they hold. And it would also be interesting because mathematicians, they really want to understand why theorems are true, not just that they are true. The, I mean, it's, it's, also, it's always nice to know some, whether something's true or false, but we're really seeking, mathematics is seeking understanding. And having a computer-aided proof that requires, you know, huge case-by-case -case analysis doesn't necessarily give you a lot of understanding. Maybe it will eventually to, to AI or machines or something, but to, to people in some sense, or mathematicians in particular, we're not very satisfied with that sort of proof, even though it's, it's a, it was a great accomplishment. And, um, and there's, since then, there's been many mathematical proofs that have been done using a computer. And then it would be also interesting, I think, to have very deep modern mathematics of gauge theory and um, f three and four dimensional topology to have this implication for um, an old problem in two dimensions of coloring maps. So I think it would be quite exciting if, and, and I think it's a promising, I, I'm not gonna give any, you know, like prediction, you know, maybe, 10 years, but who knows, it could take them much longer, but hopefully this conjecture will be resolved one way or another in the near future, so thanks. Just, just to put in a clarification, that very first map you had on there, there were yeah. the white provinces you actually couldn't have colored with the four colors, because they were abutting four other colors. But I assume then if you wanted to include those, you just have to change the colors of the other things? Well, let's see, it looks like, so, yeah, so, so like Scotland, I think you there. have an, uh, another color, but yeah, it looks it, like. It looks like uh, there's four things abutting. No, I think it. you can make well, maybe Wales so. red. That little but yeah, red no, thing. That's, it's not clear that, um, yeah, you can always extend the coloring, so you might have to modify it. Yeah. Um, there's certain situations where there's very simple, I realize there's very simple proofs of the four color theorem. If you assume that every country has at least six neighbors, which is not a usual thing, but um, then actually you can find a very simple proof that um, doesn't need any computer checking. But that's not a, in general the problem is that you'll have countries that are, have very few neighbors and that makes it more constrained and harder to color in some sense. But yeah, that's, um, that's a good observation. Uh, I have a question. In your opinion, what's the practical significance of number four? Uh, why there are four colors? F suppose we need five colors or six. What would change <laughs> in the world if it would be yeah. not four? <laughs> yeah, what would it change in the world? I don't know. Um, let's see. Yeah, there's there's a very simple proof that uses um, that you can use six colors, and then there's a simpler proof that was found by Kempe that you can use five colors. It wouldn't really have any significance to map coloring. Uh, you know. It's, it's not hard to, to extend your palette to more than four colors. Um, it's, it's more just in mathematicians are intrigued by old unresolved problems and this is a problem that was just turned out to be hard and um, it, you know, it incited a lot of interesting mathematics and work. Um, and you, you, know, you, may, you never know, um, you know where, what techniques might be useful for something um, in, in the future. So I don't have a good answer though as to, you know, it's not gonna cure cancer or anything as far as I know.
last one right here. Yeah. Is there a three-dimensional version of the four-color problem? Oh, yeah, great, yeah. So that, um, there, there are various formulations. Um, again, the, the difficulty in three dimensions is, is that you can make countries um, you adjacent. So like if you had N countries, which were all shared a common border, then, um, then you, you would need N colors. And you, in three dimensions, you can do that. So you have, to, you have to constrain the problem in some way. And there are formulations like certain polytopes or things. So you, you require the faces to be, to be flat or various things. And you can find lists of these problems, uh, like a math overflow. There's a collection of problems like this. That there's there's way, other ways you can generalize it. There's a so-called Hadwiger's conjecture. That's a, another kind of generalization that's sort of like a high dimensional, but it's purely graph theoretic. Uh, <clears throat> that's sort of extending Kuratowski's criterion and then asking. Um, so. Um, but yeah, the, the, there's, um, there's, there's a variety of ways you, extend, you can extend it, but um, it, there's not so much that's proved. There, I think in general there's, there's bounds on various problems, but not, not precise formulas for the number of columns. But yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Yeah, thanks. Thank